most of you, all of you, I'm sure, have heard the expression, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. And it's something to always keep in mind, lest we say something foolish about someone that someone else thinks is beautiful. I heard a story one time, I don't remember all of it, but it was a young man working at a grocery store, and his boss had been very impressed with how quick he was on his feet. Uh, getting himself out of situations after he had said something to a customer and, and the boss asked him, uh, said, how is it that you're able to think so quick on your feet? And he said, because I'm from Canada and the only thing we've got in Canada is ugly women and hockey teams and you got to be careful how you talk up there. And the boss got a real kind of stern look on his face and said, my wife is from Canada. And he said, really, which team did she play for? <laughs> got to be careful, you know, beauty is in the eye of the beholder and we have to remember that. But uh, I want to look, think tonight also about the fact that value is in the wallet of the buyer. Value is in the wallet of the buyer. I read an article the other day about a couple that was getting married. And before they got married and, and moved in together, they were doing it the right way. Uh, they decided they needed to go through and get rid of a lot of the stuff they had. They had, you know, two sets of dishes, two sets of living room furniture, dining room furniture. And so uh, the, the, uh, beyond the, the woman was going through and getting rid of everything. And in the uh, man's garage, she found a framed copy of the Declaration of Independence. You know, of course, it's not original or anything. She asked him about it. And he said, you know, that's been in the family for years. You know, I got it from my dad. And, and, you know, it's just a copy of, of it, so, you know, get rid of it. So she did. She boxed it up with everything else, took it down to the Goodwill, and a guy was shopping in Goodwill and saw that, and so he bought it for $2.47. And a week later, he auctioned it for $177,000. Because he recognized it when he saw it, and he knew that it was a, a very unique and rare copy that was made in the early 1800s. And, and he knew that. The, the guy that, that gave it to the bill, you know, they, the, the TV stations found out about it, and they went and they asked him about it. And he said, I knew it had been in my family for a long time, but I didn't know it had been there that long. He said, and, I, and I'm not upset that the guy, you know, sold it and made all that money. He said, if I had still owned it, it would still be hanging in my garage. Uh, but to, to the guy who owned it, it was just a piece of paper. But to someone who knew what it was, it was worth $177,000. Value is in the wallet of the buyer. And, and I know that for me, there are a lot of times that I don't feel that I'm very valuable. And I don't know if any of you have ever felt that way before. There have been periods in my life where I've done things that I realized afterwards, you know, I, I really shouldn't have done that. And, and those kind of thoughts can make you start feel not very good about yourself. Sometimes we get a little older in life and there are things we can't do the way we used to do them and we can start feeling like maybe I'm not worth as much anymore. Before long, we, we, we can start really feeling that I don't really have much worth or much value. I can't participate as much as I used to. You know, for me, you know, you look and, and you think, you know, I, there, in, in our world today, there's a lot of people out there that don't have jobs. Not because they don't want a job, they just can't get one. And that really can make someone feel not worthy. You know, a, a man wanting to provide for his family, wanting to support his family who can't find a job and can't make ends meet. A, a wife that can't seem to keep her marriage together. And, and couples that can't keep their kids in line. Before long you can start to feel like we're not worth much of anything. But again, we need to remember that value is in the wallet of the buyer. When my dad was in junior high or high school, I can't remember when he told me this story, he had he raised a, a steer for the local 4-H show. Uh, we raised lambs when I was a kid, but daddy used to raise steers. And, and uh, he had taken the steer to the local Sutton County 4-H show, and it was either the champion or grand champion. 
And so since it did well there, they took it up to San Angelo and they entered it in the San Angelo Stock Show and Rodeo and it did pretty well there. And so they went to Abilene and, and so they kept kind of making the circuit with this year and finally they ended up at the big one, which is the Houston Livestock Show and Rodeo. And they get down there to Houston and uh, they unload the steer, they put him in the show bar and they get him bedded down and everything, but Danny said they started, they noticed that the steer just didn't seem to be acting quite himself. And so that night they uh, just got him bedded down, gave him plenty of food, plenty of water and everything, came back the next morning and they knew there was something wrong with his steer, so they called the vet and the vet comes in and looks at it and says, you know what, he's got pneumonia. And so they're like, well, what are we going to do? And the vet said, well, we can give him a lot of antibiotics. Let's just see if we can get him through the show, and then we'll figure out what to do. So they did. He made it through the show. He didn't do very well because he was so sick. And so then they said, well, now all we got to do is get him through the sale. Because, you know, after the Houston Stock Show Rodeo, there aren't any more stock shows. Uh, so they, they auction off all of the steers. Now these are steers that can be bred, and so the people that buy them are either just going to eat them or they're just buying them to give this kid money, you know, because that's the way a lot of us paid for our college. We did 4-H, and so there would be people there that would want to bid so that the kid showing the animal could have the money. So the day of the show, my dad gets there that morning and goes in, and his steer is dead. And so... Daddy asked his 4-H leader, he said, what do I do? And the 4-H leader said, you know, I don't know, let me go check with them and see. And so they went and talked to the officials, and the officials said, you know, this is really kind of a fundraiser thing for the kids, so just have him take the halter and the lead rope out there, and we'll explain to everyone what happened, and we'll see if anybody would like to purchase a dead steer. So Dad goes out there. <clears throat> and, and I've seen pictures of my dad, you know, back in the 50s, 40s and 50s, grew up in West Texas, you know, the big high water pants, you know, that, that looked like they don't, I think he had a belt all around his waist, he looked like something from the Beverly Hillbillies, and I can just picture him standing there with his halter and this lead rope, and they're telling this story about how this steer won, you know, champion or grand cha or reserve champion in the Sutton County Rodeo and did well in the San Angelo Rodeo and the Abilene Rodeo and then got here and got pneumonia and, and died. So if you'd like to help this young man out, we're going to start bidding. And Dad said they took off. And, and he said before long the auctioneer had to stop. Because if they didn't stop, his dead steer was going to outsell the great champion that year. You know? <laughs> because they felt sorry for him. And, and, you know, value is in the wallet of the buyer. And with that in mind, I want you to, to look in your Bibles at Romans chapter 5. Beginning in verse 6. Romans chapter 5, beginning in verse 6. The Apostle Paul writes, You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrated His own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We've been looking at reasons that Jesus came to die. And one of the reasons Jesus came to die was to show us how valuable we are to God. John chapter 3 verse 16 says, For God so loved the world that He sent His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have everlasting life. And have you ever stopped to think about no matter how invaluable we feel, no matter how worthless we feel, no matter how down on ourselves we are, no matter how dead we feel, God values <coughs> us so highly that He paid the life of His Son for us. Value is in the wallet 
of the buyer. And we are more precious to God than we can ever even begin to imagine. And, and at the same time, I want us to think about, about this. And I was reading a book by a guy named John Piper the other day. You know, because we can we can think about it that way and think, wow, I'm I'm pretty something, I'm something else. You know, God, God thinks the world of me. You may not like me, but God really likes me. In fact, he likes me so much he sent his son for me. And we can start thinking, you know, how great we are, which is true, but we need to keep this all in perspective. And I was reading this book by John Piper, and he had this statement in there, and it took me a while to grasp it. He said, he said uh, Jesus didn't die for frogs. And I thought about that, and I thought, well, that doesn't even make sense. But I kept reading a little bit further, and, and I began to understand what he was talking about. Now, I don't know about you, I don't like frogs, you know, I, I really don't. They're ugly, they're slimy, you know, maybe there are some people that do like frogs. I know people that like cats. If anybody likes some, I've got two, I would gladly get rid of at this point. I know people that like dogs, I know people that like parakeets and all kinds of other animals, but I don't know anyone that really just loves frogs. Does anybody here? Just love frogs. It's hard to cuddle with a frog, you know. They, they don't mind very well. Uh, wherever they go, they leave goo behind. You know, I every now and then during the summer, I will walk up to put my dogs in the kennel, and sometimes I'll go barefoot, and I have stepped on snakes. That doesn't bother me. Of course, we don't have any poisonous ones up here that I'm aware of. But it doesn't bother me to step on a snake, but if I step on a frog, it just grosses me out, scares me to death. I, I don't like frogs. They're, they're just goofy. They're not worth anything. But Jesus didn't die for frogs. Because frogs, as low and despicable as they are, had never willfully disobeyed God. They're not sinners. As low as a frog is, we have done things that have separated us from God even worse than frogs. God didn't come and die for frogs. He didn't need to die for frogs. Frogs had never disobeyed, never rebelled, never been hard-hearted. We have. Jesus came to die on the cross not only to show us how valuable we are to God, but to show us how much we need the Savior's sacrifice. Because we are disobedient, rebellious, sinful people in need of that Savior's sacrifice. Let's pray. Our Father, we, we thank you for sending your Son to die. Not just to absorb your wrath, not just to pay our debt, but also to help us see how much you love us and how worthy we are to you. And at the same time, Father, we see in his death that we truly need that because we are more willfully sinful than any other creature. And yet you'll love us that much that you'll pay the ultimate price for us. And I pray, Father, that you will help us to always keep these things in perspective, realizing how cherished we are by you and also how great of a debt you paid for us. Help us keep that in mind. And Father, as we go out in our daily lives, we, we meet people all the time who do not feel worthy. They do not feel good about themselves. Help us to share with them how valuable they are to you. Father, that's our mission. That's our goal. We pray that you will help us do that boldly. And Father, I pray that if, it, if there is anyone here tonight who has not yet realized the debt you paid for them, I pray that you will help them to come forward, repent of their sin, 
be buried with your son in baptism and raised to a new life. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. If there is anyone here tonight that needs to respond in any way, uh, we're going to offer an opportunity to do that right now while we stand and sing this song.